Last time, we built viruses, and we built really stable particles. We called them metastable, because they have to protect the genome as they go from cell to cell or host to host, but under some conditions, they have to come apart. And we call that metastability, and today we are going to explain what metastability is in the sense that what triggers viruses to give up their cargo, which of course is the nucleic acid genome. And I want to keep, keep one thing in mind during this. I hear I have in my hand poliovirus again, uh, which I brought in last time. And last time we focused on the capsid. But today we're going to focus on getting out what's inside it. So this has a 7,442 base genome in it. And as I told you last time, it's been beaded in the right sequence by a virologist. Ann Palmenberg at the University of Wisconsin. I visited her once and she worked on rhinoviruses and she had one of these in her office. And I said, boy, I would like that for polio. And a year later, it showed up. She said, I, wa I, I made it during the World Cup. It was so boring. <laughs> so it's been taking me over a minute to get this out, right? It's tangled. When this virus hits the right trigger in a cell, the RNA is out like that, microseconds. So that's something amazing that's done in there to do that, right? Because I, I certainly can't get it out. And that's the problem we're going to look at today, uh, how the viruses give up their cargo. And the key here is that viruses are too big to diffuse across the plasma membrane of a cell. Remember, they're obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get in a cell in order to reproduce, but the plasma membrane of the cell is not allowing them to diffuse across it. And so, for that reason, uh, viruses of animal cells, at least, have to bind to cell receptors on the surface and be taken up into cells by pathways that exist in the cells already to take up macromolecules, for example. Viruses have evolved to use them as well. There are a few viruses, actually, that don't need to bind receptors, um, and that includes uh, viruses of many plants where they're injected into the cell by vectors, insect and worm vectors. And there's some viruses of fungi that never leave the cell. So they don't have this issue of getting back in. They just divide and when the cell divides, the viruses go to the, uh, the new cells. But for the most, most of the viruses we talk about in this course, they need to bind receptors to get into cell to begin that destabilization process. And the way a virus encounters a cell is random. It's just bouncing around. You know, viruses are bouncing around in the air. You inhale them, they bounce into the right cell on your respiratory tract, meaning the one that has the receptor that it will bind to. And these are all random events. So adhering to the cell surface, there's no specificity to it. If there happens to be a receptor on a specific cell that a virus bumps into, it will bind and be taken up into the cell uh, by those receptors. And typically there's one receptor per virus, per kind of virus, but there may be more than one, as you will see. And then the genome gets in the cell by a process that will go in, in in some detail today. And this is partly why viruses make so many progeny, because they're finding a cell in which they can reproduce this is a pretty random event. So you make billions and billions of particles, and maybe a few will land in the right place and initiate an infection. So, as I said before, cell receptors for viruses are essential for all viruses except fungi and plants, which I told you previously. In fungi, they go from cell to cell as the cell divides. In plants, they're in, they get in by mechanical damage or vectors. This is a relatively new field, virus receptors. As of 1985, we only knew one virus receptor for influenza virus, which happened to be a small sugar known as sialic acid that was pretty easy to discover. Uh, and then after that time, lots of other receptors have been identified. And that's because after 1985, many enabling technologies that allow us to identify which cell surface protein is the receptor for this virus were developed. Let me say at the, off, at the outset, no receptor on the cell exists to let viruses in, okay? You need to know that. These, these proteins or sugars on the cell surface all have other functions. 
and the viruses have adapted to be able to use them. It would be kind of silly to let viruses come in on purpose, right? Uh, unless they helped you, which, which could be. Anyway, these are some enabling technologies. Recombinant DNA, of course, one of the first to be the ability to clone genes, individual genes, put them in plasmids uh, and, and study them. Monoclonal antibodies, an antibody against one epitope, one eight or 10 amino acid sequence in a protein that could help you identify receptors. Flow cytometry, the ability to pass single cells past a laser and sort the cells depending on what is on their surface, maybe labeled by a monoclonal antibody. Of course, nucleotide sequencing so that we can see the genes that are involved. And more recently, siRNA, small interfering RNA, and CRISPR-Cas9 have come into play because now you can do whole genome screens to identify receptors. For example, you can buy genome-wide siRNA or SG short guide RNA libraries for CRISPR work that target all the open reading frames in a genome multiple times, three to six times. You can buy them, you can put them in vectors and deliver them into cells at a low multiplicity, 0.001, so that you get one or less infection per cell. You don't want multiple infections because these viruses are gonna deliver either siRNAs or CRISPR and knock out genes. So you don't want to have more than one knocked out per cell. That's why you use a low multiplicity of infection. And now since you've learned that last time or the time before, you know exactly why we do use a low MOI. So these have enabled uh, us to discover many, many virus receptors. There are some general criteria that we have to say, oh, this cell surface protein is a receptor for this particular virus. Uh, first, that the receptor binds the virus particle. You can do some kind of assay to show that, uh, that an antibody against the receptor will block infection, but that by itself is not enough because the antibody might bind a neighboring protein, not the actual attachment receptor, and sterically hinder. A really good one is if you can get a gene from a cell and put it into another cell that's not susceptible and show that that allows the virus to bind. And you can identify these genes in many ways, including doing genome-wide CRISPR screens, for example. It's harder to do that kind of experiment if you have more than one receptor that is needed. If you have one, then putting a single gene in will confer susceptibility. But if you need more than one, and that can happen for some viruses, it, it won't work. And finally, uh, the latest technology is to disrupt the gene. If you have come to say this gene encodes the poliovirus receptor, if you disrupt it and the cells are no longer susceptible, that is really part of the proof. So all these, uh, these criteria are important. Most papers on receptors don't do all of them, but some of them do. Now here's a, a picture of some virus receptors. There are just many, many out there that have been discovered, too many to put on one slide. But what I wanted to tell you here is, first of all, of course, these are all plasma membrane proteins. We know the plasma membrane is a lipid bilayer with lots of proteins of different kinds embedded in it. There are transmembrane proteins. There are proteins, glycoproteins, with sugars attached to them. There are lipid-anchored proteins and so forth. And receptors fall into all of these categories. And the bottom is just a depiction of a variety of proteins involved in the attachment and entry of different viruses. The viruses are all abbreviated here, and you don't need to know what any of them are, you just need to know they're all different, and that can give you some information. For example, here on the left, we have some attachment factors, heparan sulfate, proteoglycan, sialic acid, which is a sugar in a glycoprotein. You can see a variety of viruses can attach to those. And then we have entry receptors, where is whereas the virus binding to that moiety will actually take it into the cell. And you can see all kinds of proteins are involved here. Gangliosides, uh, typical transmembrane uh, proteins. There are also uh, GPI-linked proteins and so forth. There are monomers, there are multimers, there are immunoglobulin-like proteins with an Ig domain. There are multi-pass proteins. All kinds of proteins can serve as virus receptors. And as I said before, these all have some cell function. That's essential, and the viruses have just been selected in order to bind to these. A couple of general, more general principles. First of all, 
different viruses can sometimes bind the same receptor as you saw from that slide. For each molecule, you could see a number of different virus abbreviations on the top. Uh, here's one that I like very much. It's, it is a receptor that is shared by adenovirus and Coxsackie virus. So Coxsackie virus is a virus related to polio, the virus sitting up here on the table. It's adeno on the left there with the Sputniks and Coxsackie, the little icosahedral particle. Coxsackie viruses were first isolated in Coxsackie, New York. And uh, that's upstate exit 21B on the New York State Thruway. One day I was driving by and I had a camera and I took a picture of it so I could show classes forever. <laughs> Where Coxsackie? It was an outbreak of a paralytic disease in the 1940s and it was thought to be polio. And when they isolated the virus, it was not polio. It was a related virus and they called it after the town. If it were today, they wouldn't want a virus named after them because nowadays people don't like uh, and I will give you some examples later of that. Anyway, Coxsackie and adenovirus share a common receptor. Uh, a herpes virus of swine called pseudorabies virus, completely confusing name. It doesn't cause rabies. Maybe that's why it's pseudorabies, right? Anyway, it infects pig. It's a herpes virus. It binds the same receptor as human poliovirus. So we have lots of examples of this. And I think the reason is in part because there are only about 1,500 plasma membrane proteins that we know of, so there has to be some overlap. Sometimes viruses of the same family bind different receptors. Rhinoviruses, as I'll tell you later, they bind three different receptors depending on the type of the rhinovirus, and some herpes viruses bind many different receptors. Here's herpes simplex virus type 1, where there are many glycoproteins in the virus particle, and you can see these interact with a number of cell surface molecules. So the, the idea is that there's not just one-on-one -on -one relationship here. You can have different permutations. Let's talk a little bit about how viruses attach to cell receptors. Now, in general, we have really two kinds of viruses that we, we talk about. We have these on the table here, polioviruses, where you have a a spherical shell built with icosahedral symmetry. It's relatively smooth, and understanding how this attaches to a cell receptor is a bit challenging. And then we have uh, envelope viruses with glycoproteins in their envelope, where it's a little easier to understand how those could attach to receptors, as you'll see. So let's talk first about these spherical viruses. Here's poliovirus on the left and rhinovirus, and these are the three-dimensional structures solved by crystallography many years ago. And both cases, what we have is a complex of the receptor bound to the virus. So this is obviously a soluble form of the receptor protein taken away from the membrane. And you can see in the case of polio, in both cases, the receptor molecules are shown in gray. And every attachment site for the receptor is occupied. Uh, and um, here on the left, you can see, well, if you could count them, there would be 60 attachment sites. Five per uh, around each fivefold axis of symmetry times 12 fivefold axes of symmetry. Uh, and here there are 12 on the right rhinoviruses. The nature of the receptor binding site is that it's binding around the fivefold. There are also 60 molecules, but there are only 12 clusters of them. So you can see on the left that the receptor sticks out far from the particle. This is an Ig like protein with three immunoglobulin like domains. It's called CD155. It's actually identified in my laboratory uh, in the early 90s. And um, the way it fits into the virus particle is shown here. The very first Ig-like domain fits into a groove that encircles the five-fold axis of symmetry. The blue pentamer, pentamer there, that's a five-fold axis of symmetry right on the top. One, two, three, four, five receptors around it. And that's, that's what you would predict. This is a repeating structure after all. So if there are binding sites, you're going to find them many times. So this receptor fits into a groove in the, in the surface of the particle. Right? It fits right in there and it interacts. For rhinovirus, rhinoviruses also have this groove, which we call a canyon, but the receptor for some rhinoviruses, which happens to be this molecule, is low-density lipoprotein receptor. It doesn't bind in the canyon, it binds on the plateau. There is a very flat plateau at the five-fold axis you can see in this schematic at the lower left. And that's where those receptors bind. So even though there's a canyon, the receptor doesn't fit into it. So the point here is that 
you can have varied interactions of these spherical viruses with receptors. They don't have to involve uh, geographically deep pits or canyons. It can just be protein-protein interactions. And that's, that's enough to get these viruses into cells. How about adenovirus? This is an icosahedral virus, but it's got a unique solution and that has these fibers sticking out from each five-fold axis of symmetry. So there on the upper left is an electron micrograph of the particle, and you can see the icosahedral symmetry. On the lower left is the structure of the particle determined by a mixture of cryo-EM and X-ray crystallography. You can see the capsid itself mainly made up of hexon trimers. And then at each five-fold axis, there's a, a pentamer, and from that it comes out a fiber with a knob at the end. And that's shown in panel A here. That's the actual structure of this fiber knob. It, the fiber is, is, a, is a trimer, actually. And it's attached to a penton base, which is shown in yellow here. And it, on the virus particle, it's in blue. So that's how this fiber is attached to the virus particle. And the very end of the fiber, the knob interacts with the receptor for this virus, which I told you earlier is carr adeno adenoreceptor. And so this in uh, blue here is car, and in uh, blue, red, and yellow, that's the, f the knob of uh, the receptor of adenovirus, which fits onto the car molecule. So in this case, the receptor doesn't fit into a surface or a depression on the particle, but on these fibers. So let's talk now about envelope viruses. Uh, envelope viruses, as we said last time, always have glycoproteins in their membrane. So here's influenza virus, and uh, we are in the middle of influenza season right now. It's going to continue until the end of this course, actually. And this is the virus that causes influenza. It's, it's an envelope virus, and in the interior, there are eight nucleocapsids, RNA protein complexes. It's a segmented genome, but in the membrane are a number of different glycoproteins, which we will encounter multiple times. In this course, we have the hemagglutinin, or the HA, and the neuraminidase. And it is the hemagglutinin that attaches to cell receptors. The neuraminidase does other things that we'll talk about later. And you can see here, the depiction of all these uh, guitar-like hemagglutinins are binding to orange cell receptors on the cell surface. Now, how, how this works has been studied in very great detail. So let me tell you a little bit about it. The attachment of the HA to a cell receptor, it's to a proteinaceous receptor, but the actual contact between the HA and the receptor is via a sugar known as sialic acid. And here are some sialic acids here. Uh, there are two different kinds that are shown here uh, linked via, so here's the sialic acid, the first residue. When you have a glycoprotein, which is depicted on the upper left. The protein here is a transmembrane protein. We have sugar side chains attached to specific amino acids. Sialic acid is always the last sugar. The yellow spheres there, those are sialic acids, and the flu HA binds to those. The nature of the protein doesn't seem to matter for binding. The sugar is all that matters, and actually, the linkage between the first and second sugar can make a difference, as you can see here. So here is sialic acid in yellow, and it can be linked to the next sugar, which in this case is a galactose, but it could be other things. Here it's by an alpha-2-3 linkage, or in the other case it's by an alpha-2-6 linkage. Just different parts of the ring of the sugar are, are joined to each other. But that makes a big difference in terms of the tropism. For example, uh, human strains of influenza virus prefer to bind alpha-2-6 linked sialic acids. And we have these throughout our respiratory from the upper to the lower respiratory tract. But avian influenza viruses, now the, the source of every influenza virus is a variety of birds, water birds mostly, but all sorts of birds. And they mostly have alpha-2-3 linked sialic acids in them and the viruses that infect them have that receptor specificity. And we do have alpha-2-3, but it's lower in the lung. And so for these viruses to infect us is a little more difficult. We're gonna come back to this later when we talk about the pathogenesis uh, of these viruses. So sialic acids are the receptor for uh, influenza viruses. A number of years ago, the structure of the hemagglutinin 
protein was solved complex with sialic acid. So we could see exactly how the ligand fit into the virus glycoprotein. So here's the hemagglutinin. And now we're looking at one hemagglutinin molecule. This is a monomer where we have the viral membrane at the bottom and then we have uh, the, sort of a fibrous stem and then there's a globular head at the top. This protein as it's present on the influenza virus particle is always a trimer. What I show you here is a monomer because it's simpler to see the, the parts. The receptor binding part of this HA is at the tip of the globular head and on the right here we've expanded the head and we're looking down onto the globular head and that green molecule is sialic acid and you can see it binds in a pocket in the head and it makes interactions with a variety of side chains of amino acids uh, on the viral HA protein. And again, sialic acid, the ability to bind sialic acid is influenced greatly by the second uh, sugar that's bound to the sialic acid. And as I said, that can influence tropism of these viruses. So this is a really important interaction because it regulates the ability of this virus to infect various hosts. And the, the, a feature of influenza is that it frequently jumps from animal hosts into people, and that's why we have frequent outbreaks of this virus, and we'll come back to that later. HIV is another virus that we'll talk about in some detail. This is an enveloped retrovirus. It has a nucleocapsid surrounded by a membrane, and there are glycoproteins inserted uh, into the membrane that attach to receptors on the cell. And uh, the receptor for HIV-1 it, one of the receptors is a T cell protein called CD4, actually discovered at Columbia University as the HIV receptor. And CD4 is shown in brown in each of these two diagrams on the right. It interacts with uh, the surface protein, or SU, of HIV-1. So you can see we know the exact structure of how these two interact. That structure was also solved uh, at Columbia. And we have the, green, the red viral glycoprotein interacting with the CD4 protein. And we happen to know that there's a cavity on the bottom or on the top of SU, and into that fits a very specific residue of CD4 phenylalanine. And if you change that phenylalanine to any other amino acid, it will not bind uh, to the viral glycoprotein any longer. So that's another way that a glycoprotein can interact, this time with a protein, not a sugar residue. So our first question is all about viral receptors on the cell surface, A, they can bind directly to icosahedral virus capsid proteins. B, they can interact with glycoproteins of enveloped viruses. C, they can be carbohydrate or protein molecules. D, they have cellular functions, or E, all of the above. So the answer is all of the above. Most of you got that. Every one, every one uh, answer is correct, of course, but the best answer is all of the above. I've told you each of those things uh, so far. So we've talked very briefly about binding modalities of viruses to receptors. Now, of course, once the virus is bind, has bound a receptor, needs to get into the cell, let's talk about how that happens. So we can, again, make general principles that relate to this. Now, cells have ways to get things into them, as you know. Um, here are some different modes of cells taking up various components. You know all about phagocytosis, of course, where cells that are specialized for that process take up large particles like bacteria. Uh, but we typically don't envision this to be a productive means of virus entry into cell. More the, the mechanisms on the right, which are different kinds of endocytosis. These are, again, involved in taking up material. Ma Macropinocytosis is a mechanism whereas, whereby cells nonspecifically take up materials into the cell, small molecules and so forth. It involves uh, ruffling of, of uh, projections from the plasma membrane and then the capture of material shown by these red dots into vesicles which are then brought into the cell by the vesicular pathway. And then of course there's receptor mediated endocytosis where materials in the extracellular medium are specifically taken up by virtue of them binding to receptors. So here we have a receptor on the cell surface is binding a ligand and that interaction stimulates the production of vesicles that pass through the endocytic pathway. And this pathway has evolved uh, 
to not only bring in materials, but then to take them out and liberate them into the cytoplasm. It involves fusion with lysosomes at a late stage. The lysosomes can deliver proteases and nucleases to the endosome to liberate any components that are needed, which can then uh, exit the pathway. And viruses can get into cells. Viruses mainly get in by endocytosis, typically receptor-mediated, but there are also some examples of macropinocytosis entry. Now, when we draw pictures of viruses getting into cell, we ignore the fact that the cell cytoplasm is really crowded. And it's simply not the case that a virus particle can get into the cytoplasm and just diffuse wherever it wants in the cytoplasm. Here's an artist's depiction of the cell. You start at the plasma, it has to be divided into segments because it's too long to fit on one slide. Here's the plasma membrane on the left, uh, some plasma membrane glycoproteins, actin microfilaments below, and then as you move down, we have, uh, we have a lot of ribosomes. Those are the pink structures, some microtubules. We move further down, we're getting some, uh, uh, looks like Golgi, and then endoplasmic reticulum. Then the third panel looks like a nuclear pore and materials moving in and there at the bottom is the nucleus and we have some nucleosomes and then at the top right we're in the nucleus uh, with its DNA and other components. So movement doesn't occur by diffusion. That's the point of all this. There have to be motors that bring things around and that includes viruses as well. And uh, here's a summary of many ways that viruses get into the cell. We'll talk about a subset of these today. Um, on the top, we have a variety of endocytic mechanisms. We have viruses binding and being taken up into uh, clathrin-coated vesicles, which become early endosomes. And these endosomes, of course, are brought down towards the nucleus on microtubules, and they're transported by dynein motors that require energy to move the endosome down. And of course, this, this endosome contains a virus particle. And at some point, the RNA has to leave the endosome so that it can start replicating in the cell. So this is clathrin-dependent endocytosis. There are many other flavors of endocytosis that are shown here, but uh, are, are not so important for you to understand, but I'll point them out. Clathrin and caviolin-independent pathways, caviolin-dependent endocytosis. And these are all defined by protein markers of the vesicles and where the cargo goes. The, the caviolin-dependent pathways, which are used by viruses, uh, deliver the particle to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is quite interesting. So endocytosis is, is a pathway of entry for many viruses. We'll look at the details of this with some specific viruses in a moment. And the key here is that the vesicles move by motor proteins that require ATP. Uh, here is a, another example on the left side of viruses that actually don't enter by endocytosis, but they get in at the plasma membrane. And so here are two enveloped viruses. Uh, the one on top is an enveloped icosahedral shed particle. And the membrane is fusing at the plasma membrane. Now we have the nucleocapsid, which is delivered to microtubules. It's carried by dynein uh, and all the way down to the nucleus, where it can then dock on a nuclear pore and get its DNA into the nucleus. And we'll talk about uh, a virus that gets in that way. And then we have an enveloped virus here on the left side, which is attaching via its glycoproteins to receptors. It's fusing right at the plasma membrane, and the RNA, the nucleocapsid, is right in the cytoplasm where its expression can begin. On this slide are all enveloped viruses for the most part. Here we have a polyomavirus on the upper right. Um, but for the most part, they're enveloped, uh, illustrated here, and you get fusion of viral and host cell membranes to carry out these events, these entry events, and these are mediated by what we call viral fusion proteins. So that hemagglutinin that I mentioned to you earlier it is also, besides being an attachment protein, it is a fusion protein. It catalyzes fusion of the virus in the cell membrane so that eventually the genome can get out of the cell. For non-enveloped viruses, there are other mechanisms to get the genome out, and we'll, we'll talk about all of those. Now, I think we have next a, a movie, an animation, of a dynein motor riding on a microtubule pulling an endosomal vesicle after it. So this is sort of what happens. Uh, you know, the cytoplasm, again, is not crowded because the artist either didn't know that or choose, chose not to illustrate it as being not very crowded. 
But the point I want to make is that if these are virus-containing vesicles, they're being brought into the cell on this normal endocytic pathway. These are microtubules that stretch from the plasma membrane down to the, near the nucleus. And these are motor proteins that are walking along here. They're, uh, they're breaking down ATP. Uh, and so that movement is needed because these vesicles simply cannot diffuse. A virus infection would take weeks if it depended on diffusion. This is one of several cool animations we'll look at. Virus entry is well served by neat uh, animations. Let's first look at some virus entry at the plasma membrane. So here's a, there are a number of viruses that do this. Um, one of them is a measles-like virus. Measles is a member of the paramyxovirus family, measles virus, uh, Sendai virus, and many others. They fuse at the plasma membrane. Also, HIV-1 does the same, and the two mechanisms are shown here. So in general, we have an envelope virus with glycoproteins in its envelope. It's attaching to cell receptors on the plasma membrane, and right there, the membrane of the virus fuses with that of the host cell, and that puts the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm, where it can then be expressed. Now, this fusion is regulated. It has to be regulated, because these viruses are going to be bumping into all kinds of cells, and they can't just fuse with any cell that they bump into. That would be totally nonproductive, because not every cell is going to be permissive. So the primary determinant, of course, is interacting with the receptor. But even beyond that, there has to be other regulatory mechanisms of fusion, and they're shown here. So here below, we have two mechanisms of how fusion is regulated. And we start on the left in panel B. We have the viral membrane is shown, and, and the cell membrane is below it, but you can't see it in this little panel. And this particular virus, this measles virus, has two glycoproteins in its envelope. They're called HN and F. So HN is a hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. It's two different kinds of proteins together. Uh, and it attaches to the cell receptor. So what happens with these viruses, they bump into cells, and if they have the right receptor, which is this red protein, the HN protein will bind to it. And if that happens, then the second event that happens is this F peptide, the polypeptide, which is F stands for fusion protein, it flips out and inserts into the membrane, has a hydrophobic sequence at its end terminus, it catalyzes fusion of the virus in the cell membrane. So only upon receptor engagement will this peptide flip out. Normally it's hidden so that it doesn't just fuse with any cell that it encounters. So that's the first level of control, receptor engagement. The second is that this fusion peptide will not be exposed unless it's cleaved by a protease during virus maturation. And so here you can see that um, normally the, the F protein is present and the, it's not cleaved. That little jagged line between F1 and F2, that's the fusion peptide. It's a hydrophobic sequence that can insert into membranes. The cleavage liberates the end terminus of the fusion peptide so that when it is conformationally altered by receptor engagement, now the fusion peptide could go into the cell membrane. If it's not cleaved, that will not happen because the end terminus will not be exposed. The other mechanism of regulating fusion is shown on the bottom, and this is how HIV-1 binds to cells and enters them. Uh, the HIV-1 particle has a glycoprotein on it. I, I previously showed you the SU portion, which binds the receptor CD4, but there's also another portion called TM for transmembrane. TM carries the fusion peptide. Upon receptor engagement, SU binds CD4, the green molecule, there's a conformational change con transmitted throughout SU upon CD4 engagement. That exposes a binding site for a second receptor, a chemokine receptor, CCR. SU will then bind CCR. And only then, when the two receptors are engaged, will the fusion peptide swing out and insert into the membrane. So here we have a slightly different version of control. We have two receptors required to get binding and exposing the fusion protein, and the regulation involves a series of conformational changes in the protein. So HIV requires two distinct receptor proteins to enter cells, CD4 and some kind of chemokine receptor, CCR5 or CX15. 
CR4. I think we now have a movie of HIV-1 fusing to cells. That's HIV-1 in red. That blue purple thing is supposed to be a T4 positive, CD4 positive lymphocyte. The virus is approaching. And here are the two receptors uh, that are going to be bound by the virus. And there's our virus. And one thing you notice is that the glycoproteins are pretty sparse compared to, say, influenza virus. There's the uh, SU portion of the glycoprotein. There's the TM with the fusion peptide nestled against the virus particle. So it's hidden. And you can see it's a trimer. So SU is going to interact with CD4 first transmits a conformational change and now in binding to the chemokine receptor, which is the little mushroom guy below it. And then the, the artist got tired and threw everything away, so he or she just shows the, uh, the fusion peptide being folded away from the virus and inserted uh, into the plasma membrane. Okay, so obviously those proteins, the viral glycoproteins and the receptors, they don't go away, they remain there, but it's clearer to show if you do this. So again, the fusion is regulated by the need to interact with two different receptors. And here's another movie of how the fusion works. Uh, the, the glycoprotein, it's actually a trimer made of three monomers, it has a fusion peptide at the end terminus, it has a helical region, and here's the viral membrane here, uh, and so we're going to see what happens during the fusion process. Uh, this fusion peptide folds up. Conformational changes conveyed by receptor interactions uh, fold the protein up, and that's the extension that we saw. So here it's virus and cell bound. So virus is at the bottom, sorry, cells at the top, so we've reversed it. It's normally a trimer, as you saw in the previous movie. And the fusion peptide is clearly already inserted. And the way that the membranes are brought together is that these fusion peptides do what we call hairpinning. That lower portion of the protein forms another alpha helix with the central one. That bends the membranes together. And what happens initially is you get fusion of the outer leaflets initially. And eventually, we're going to get fusion of the inner leaflets. And it's all mediated by this hairpinning of the viral glycoproteins as that uh, alpha helix forms along the structure. When you look at the video, you can play it over and over to see that. It's quite instructive. So now we're going to get a complete pore formed, and the viral genome can go out uh, of the particle into, this is at the cell surface now, so it can go into the cytoplasm. And that, that is a fusion process, that conformational change in the viral glycoprotein takes place at the plasma membrane at neutral pH. And it's triggered by the two receptor interaction. And I, I mention that and emphasize that because we're gonna now, next gonna see a similar reaction where the fusion is catalyzed by low pH in an endosome. Our next question is, which of the following does not play a role in virus entry? Clathrin-mediated endocytosis, fusion, of viral and cell membranes, diffusion of virus particles in the cytoplasm, microtubule-mediated transport, sialic acids. So of course the answer is C. Diffusion does not play a role. It's always motor-driven, microtubule-motor-driven. So most of you got that. A few of you answered either A or D or E. So certainly clathrin-mediated endocytosis is involved. Microtubule mediated transporters involved in sialic acids are involved in attachment of some viruses. So we just looked at HIV fusing at the plasma membrane, and before that we looked at paramyxovirus fusion at the plasma membrane, both happening at neutral pH, and the specificity is conferred by receptor engagement and for the paramyxoviruses cleavage to liberate the fusion protein. Now let's look at an example where low pH catalyzes the fusion. So this is influenza virus entry. The virus binds to the cell surface. Here's the virus on the upper left, glycoproteins. The HA binds a sialic acid-containing receptor. 
that directs the virus to the endocytic pathway. It's taken up into the cell by endocytosis. So we have in the top a series of images, sort of uh, big view images of the virus getting in. And then at the bottom are the details of what's happening with the HA, the virus, and the cell membrane. So here we have the receptor engagement. And the, the HA is shown as a trimer. There are three globular heads that are binding um, the, the sialic acid receptor. And um, you can't see the fusion proteins, but they are buried near the viral membrane at the beginning. So we have uptake into the endocytic pathway. As endosomes move towards the nucleus, their pH drops. That's a normal process. There are pumps in the endosome membrane that pump protons into the endosome. That acidifies the interior. And as the pH drops at a certain critical pH, about it depends on the virus, six, five and a half, that induces a conformational change in the hemagglutinin protein. So if you compare the second panel with the third panel, you can see the second panel, the hemagglutinin is still compacted, the fusion proteins are hidden. And here in the third panel, the pH has now dropped such that the, the HA now reorients. And you can see there are now in the cell membrane some new sequences that we haven't seen before. And that red sequence is the fusion peptide. It was previously buried down near the viral membrane. And you can see this yellow connector here on the second panel has now extended and has taken on some alpha helical character and it thrusts the fusion peptides up to the cell membrane. So now we have a situation very much like HIV where the viral fusion protein is inserted in the cell membrane. Of course, it's still attached to the virus membrane by the transmembrane segment. And uh, then the hair pinning begins. These proteins undergo further conformational changes which involve formation of an extended alpha helix, very much like the HIV protein where uh, an unordered part of the protein moves up and forms an alpha helix along with a pre-existing one. Similar thing happens here that the glycoproteins hairpin that's in the fourth panel here, they bring the membranes close together and that allows fusion. To get two membranes to fuse, you have to bring them very close together, close enough to get rid of the water molecules. And that's all you need. You just need to bring them very close together and they will fuse spontaneously. And that's what the viral glycoprotein does. It brings them close together. And then at the end, you have a pore that leads from the viral interior uh, into, well, outside of the endosome. So you can look at the fourth endocytosis step at the top here. You now have a pore between uh, the, the viral particle and the exterior of the endosome. And then the viral uh, nuclear proteins can come out. They eventually go in the nucleus, as we'll see later. That is their destiny to get into the nucleus. Now, you may wonder what this blue protein shell is around the RNA. There's another protein, the M protein, that gives the membrane some structure. And it actually has to disintegrate in order to let the RNAs out, even though there's this pore form. And that is done by a viral channel in the membrane. So there's a very small protein present in very few copies, less than 20 copies. And it allows protons, the protons that are pumped in by the ATPase into the endosome, they pass into the virus interior and they cause the M protein to degrade. And you can see the little M protein molecules falling apart here. And that lets the viral RNA get out of the particle. So this is low pH catalyzed fusion. Now, what I didn't tell you is that the fusion protein here at the end terminus has to be liberated by cleavage, just like it has to be liberated for the paramyxoviruses. It is normally buried, not only buried by the viral membrane at neutral pH, but it's also the end terminus is not free. It has to be cleaved, a new end terminus made with the fusion peptide in order for this fusion to work. So another level of control of fusion. And this is a series of structures of the HA that show that to you very nicely. So here we have um, a structure of the HA at neutral pH before cleavage of the HA polypeptide. Here's the cleavage site down here by the viral membrane. This is a monomer again, 
for clarity, the, you see this nice alpha helix here and the globular head that binds the sialic acid. Cleavage liberates uh, an N-terminus which carries the fusion peptide and then when the pH drops and the protein reorients, it gets inserted in the membrane. If you don't have this cleavage, you will not get fusion. So make sure that this happens in the right cells. So this is the, cleave stru the structure of the cleaved HA showing the new uh, N and C termini. And then this is the structure of the low pH form where you can see there's some extra alpha helix that's been formed at the top here by some of these strands that have rearranged and that thrusts the fusion peptide up to the cell membrane and inserts it into it. So these are all conformational rearrangements catalyzed by low pH which put the fusion peptide uh, into the cell membrane. All these fusion proteins I've told you so far are called class one fusion proteins. Many viruses have them. Influenza virus uh, we talked about, they're trimers, HIV-1 and Ebola. Simian virus 5 is a paramyxovirus like measles. These all have uh, structures that where the proteins are perpendicular to the membrane. You remember last time we said these glycoproteins can be perpendicular or parallel. These are perpendicular. They're mostly alpha helical, as you can see, and they form trimers. So this is a lovely picture of all these glycoproteins from these viruses, and they all look very similar, obviously. Trimers, you look down on the top, you can see the trimer structure, and they're mostly alpha helical. Okay, here's our movie of flu entry. That's the flu particle. Uh, binding to sialic acid containing receptors is taken up by endocytosis. It's a clathrin coated pit. The endosome is moving in. It will associate with a microtubule. There you go. It's being taken into the cell by microtubule. The clathrin, it's running really quickly, right? It's on caffeine. Clathrin's coming off, it's part of the normal process. Uh, and then uh, that's the fusion event. It happened very quickly. And these are the ribonucleoproteins of the virus that are coming out and getting into the nuclear pore. So you saw that the membranes fuse and then all those little purple proteins, those are the M1 proteins that are released when the interior of the virion uh, gets acidified. So that one needs to be played slower to see the details, obviously. So that's class one. We have class two fusion proteins, which are interesting because these are the ones that are parallel to the membrane. And you may think, oh, how does that engage a receptor and how does it lead to fusion? It's amazing, the same mechanisms. So these class two are mostly beta sheet. And here is a class two protein shown as a ribbon diagram. You see very little alpha helical content. These are typically dimers. And you can see that here, there's that one, one of the dimers, the monomer, is blue, yellow, red, and then the other is on the other side, and they are parallel to the membrane. On the upper right is a uh, electron, uh, sorry, a reconstruction of a dengue virus particle, and you can see these are flat dimers on the surface. You can see the five-fold axis of symmetry, so these glycoproteins are arranged icosahedrally symmetric. And, um, but they're flat, so how does this work? Well. Here's, here's on the left on the bottom diagram, lower left, that's what the two proteins look like in the viral membrane. You have transmembrane sequences that hold the proteins in the viral membrane. They're lying flat on the membrane. They can engage receptors even being flat. There are receptor binding domains uh, in these uh, proteins that engage receptors as they're flat on the membrane. Uh, but then they get taken into the endocytic pathway and as the pH drops, these proteins reorient just like the HA proteins, and you can see here uh, the reorientation, putting the very N termini of these proteins up uh, into the cell membrane, and then as the pH drops, the proteins hairpin, draw the two membranes together, and cause fusion. So just because they're parallel doesn't mean that they can't undergo these massive rearrangements upon receptor engagements and low pH drop that lead to fusion. And I think we have a, a movie of dengue virus entry. There's the particle with the glycoproteins flat, taken up into an endosome. And there's our microtubules. And it's starting to acidify. And you're going to see the proteins are going to raise up. Those little sparkly things are supposed to be low pH, I guess. So you see the glycoproteins are raising up. And the N-terminal fusion peptide is at the tip of these polypeptides. We're going to have a close-up 
inserting into the endosome membrane there. And then they're going to hairpin, pull the membranes very close together. There you go, you're going to make, bring them really close together and uh, form a pore. And uh, yeah, it looks like insects, doesn't it? You know. And here the nucleic acid is coming out through the pore from the interior of the particle uh, into the cell, the cytoplasm. And this is a plus-stranded RNA. So you can guess what happens to that next, right? It's going to be translated directly. A couple of other twists on uh, the low pH uh, mediated entry. Here is Ebola virus entry. This is a story we just learned about in the past five years or so. As you know, Ebola virus uh, very serious infect causes very serious infections, mainly in Africa. We'll talk a little bit about this later in pathogenesis. But these are filamentous virus particles, very interesting. But they're enveloped. They have a glycoprotein. Uh, embedded in the envelope, and there's a helical negative stranded nucleocapsid inside. Uh, these particles seem to be taken up by macro pinocytosis. No one has identified a specific cell surface receptor that this virus binds to. It's thought to attach non specifically to cells. It's taken up by uh, macro pinocytosis into the endocytic pathway. In the endocytic pathway, two things happen that are quite interesting. First, there are enzymes in the endosome uh, that cleave a, this uh, viral glycoprotein. So you can see the virus that's coming in has a slightly differently drawn glycoprotein from the one in the second panel here. And that's because this endosomal protease is cleaving off the top. And what that does is expose a receptor binding site. Previously, it was masked, so it presumably doesn't interact with non-functional receptors. And here we have G GP cleaved. And now when it's cleaved, it can interact with an endosomal protein on the interior of the endosome. It's called NPC1. And binding to that protein catalyzes fusion of the virus in the cell membrane. So this is a bona fide fusion receptor. Binding to that will catalyze fusion. And then the, the genome can get out into the cytoplasm. So NPC1 is an interesting protein. This, is, this stands for neiman pick cholesterol transporter. And this is a protein that's important for proper transport of cholesterol. There are individuals with a disease called neiman pick disease who, have, uh, who don't make this protein. And they're very sick. Few of them uh, live into their teens. And their fibroblasts taken from them were shown to be resistant to Ebola virus infection. That was one of the uh, bits of evidence showing that NPC1 is, in fact, a receptor for Ebola virus. So this is a different mechanism of entry. We didn't know that there would be fusion receptors that allow fusion in the endosome. But now it turns out there are other viruses that do this as well. As I said, fusion is regulated. I just want to go over this because it's very important to understand this because it can't happen in the wrong location. It has to happen in the right place, otherwise the viruses will fuse with cells that they're not going to replicate in. So how is it controlled? Well, at the plasma membrane, uh, there is a second protein receptor interaction. So you have two viral glycoproteins. One binds the receptor, and then the other will flip out and expose the fusion protein. Uh, and, and of course, another, another control at that level is cleavage. The, the F protein has to be cleaved. And we saw for HIV, two cell proteins are needed to make the specificity of this reaction. So that's plasma membrane fusion. Low pH fusion, I showed you, you draw the virus into the endosome. Low proteolytic cleavage activates the fusion protein for, for the, the protein for fusion for the class one proteins. What I didn't tell you, but important, is that for the class two glycoproteins, there's actually a cleavage of a second protein next to the class two protein that is needed for the class one protein to fusion, to fuse. And of course, there's the endosome fusion receptor for Ebola viruses. So these are all ways of regulating fusion so that it doesn't happen uh, in the wrong place. Okay, viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion into the host cell membrane when? A, the virus particle is near a cell, 
B, the virus particle is in the cytoplasm. C, trimers of fusion peptides form. D, the endosome becomes acidified. E, the virus is docked onto the nuclear pore. Okay, the answer is D, the endosome becomes acidified, which is the lowest that we've had. 60% of you got that, a little confusion. So the question is viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion into the cell membrane. Uh, being near a cell is not good enough. You have to at least engage a receptor, right? So that's not gonna work. The virus is in the cytoplasm. Well, it's already done, unless it's in the endosome, in which case it hasn't fused yet. So being in the cytoplasm is not enough. Trimers form. The fusion peptide is present in a trimer in these fusion proteins, no matter whether it's at the bottom or the top. So that's not the answer. And the last, the virus is docked onto the nuclear pore. That's after fusion has occurred already. So that's too late. So it's when the acidification occurs is when the fusion peptides are exposed. That's the key word here, exposed, because they're hidden usually. Acidification alters the conformation of the protein, the glycoprotein, and inserts them into the membrane. So we've talked mainly about envelope viruses. That's easy. Membranes fuse, they release the contents. Kind of conceptually very easy. What about a icosahedral virus like polio? How do you get that tangled mess of an RNA out of that particle? into the cell. So let's look at a couple examples. Here's adenovirus, which is clearly an icosahedral protein shell. It attaches to receptors via the fiber. It's taken up into the cell by endocytosis. Moves through the endosome. Endosomes become acidified. When the pH drops, the capsid begins to come apart because the interactions are acid dependent, and what is really, and that's shown, the acidification is shown by the protons being pumped in the endosome. When this happens, as the endosome acidifies, you see this little diamond-shaped protein, which is part of the capsid, it's one of those minor capsid proteins, protein six, it's released from the capsid. And that protein has the ability to punch holes in the endosome membrane on its own, so that's why these protein sixes are shown uh, here in the endosome, they've actually made a hole in it, and now the particle can come out. It attaches to microtubules and gets transported down to the nucleus, where it binds the nuclear pore complex and the DNA comes out. By then, it's, it's partially disassembled. That's what the dotted lines are meant to mean, because as it's passing through the endosome and the pH is dropping, not only is that protein six released, but the capsid is being disassembled as well. So that's one strategy. You partially disassemble the capsid and you have a protein in the particle that pokes holes in the endosome. You can take this protein on its own and put it in cells and it will poke holes in membranes. But it's hidden in the virus particle. It's not exposed and it is only exposed upon the drop of the pH. So that is an adenovirus. Let's talk about poliovirus here on how do you get that RNA out. So the idea is that the receptor interaction is enough to change the conformation of the particle to open up pores and let the RNA out. And in fact, if you take poliovirus and mix it with purified receptor, the RNA comes out into the solution. And that's, that's the magic there that I could not replicate. All you need is the receptor protein. But of course, on a cell, the virus binds the receptor. It goes, undergoes conformational change, which is shown by the change in color. It's taken up into vesicles, but very close to the cell surface. You don't need to get very far into the endocytic pathway. Low pH is not needed. That receptor binding has opened up a pore, and it's actually in the particle, and it's also formed a pore in the endosome membrane and the RNA passes through it, passes out of the particle and into the cytosol. And here at the bottom are some structures of, of these conformationally altered particles that support this hypothesis. So the, the structures I've shown you so far of poliovirus are of the, what we call the native particle before receptor engagement. If you mix the particle with receptors, you get what we call an altered particle, which are these uh, lighter purple structures. And those structures are shown below. So on the left, you can see a pore in this particle. It is uh, in the middle of this triangle that constitutes one of the structural subunits of the particle. And that pore gives, allows the RNA to come out. So that's all well and good. Here's the five-fold axis of symmetry, three-fold in 
and twofold and another threefold just to orient you. And so the RNA could get out, but then of course it has to cross a membrane. How does that happen? Well, we think that upon receptor engagement, proteins that are normally on the interior of the particle, in particular VP4, the N-terminus, and V, sorry, VP4 and the N-terminus of VP1, they come out and they make a channel in the membrane. And here in the upper right is a diagram of that. Here's the particle bound, and these are the VP4 in green and VP1. They're actually hydrophobic, and they can form a channel in the endosome in the RNA can come out there. And recently, a structure of this uncoding process was resolved by cryo-EM. So it's very low resolution. But here's, and here's the virus particle, and it looks like it's connected to uh, the cell membrane by some kind of umbilicus, and the idea would be that that would that umbilicus would be right over this pore. The RNA would come out through the umbilicus uh, and into the cytosol. What this is made of, this umbilicus is not known yet, but the structure is quite intriguing. So that's another example of a protein shell. The, in this case, the receptor catalyzes the changes that are needed for the RNA to get out. There is a lipid in these virus particles, and that lipid needs to leave in order for uncoding to occur. So here on the left is our icosahedral poliovirus structure. One uh, structural unit, VP1, 2, and 3. And in the middle, that's the actual ribbon diagram of the structural unit, the protomer. And the canyon is just south of the five-fold axis. That's where the receptor would bind. And at the base of the canyon, there's a little pocket that leads to the interior, and there is a lipid present in the polio particle. As you grow it up in cells and you, you do the structure, you find there's a lipid bound in every protomer, so there's 60 copies of lipid. And to make that a little clearer, here on the bottom is a depiction of what's happening. Here's the virus particle, five-fold axis, our canyon, the receptor binding into the canyon, and just below the receptor binding pipe, a little pocket, and in that pocket is this lipid. And it, it, the lipid it can be sphingosine, it can be palmitate, various lipids, but they're in most of these viruses, and they seem to have to leave in order to get these conformational changes that open up a pore. And how do they leave? When the receptor sits down on top of this pocket, the lipids leave, and that gives the particles some flexibility to undergo this, this uncoating. Now, how do we know this? There are antiviral drugs that were developed many years ago. They're called Win compounds for the company Sterling Winthrop that developed them. They were originally identified in a screen of chemical libraries for inhibitors of polio infection. And when they studied the mechanism, it turns out that they displaced the lipid from this pocket. And in fact, the diagram on the bottom is one of these chemicals or antivirals bound in the pocket. It's displaced the lipid. And these compounds bind very tightly in the pocket so that when these viruses attach to receptors and the receptors sit on top of the pocket, which now has the, the antiviral in it, the antiviral doesn't leave. It stays there so the virus can't uncoat. So that's why uh, these have antiviral properties and that's why we think the lipid has to leave in order for uncoating to occur. Unfortunately, these antivirals never were used clinically because resistance emerged too quickly. But they've been really important for understanding how uncoding occurs. And at the top right is a structure of polio with these drugs bound to it. So now we've added the drug to the particle. It's displaced all the lipids. And you can see there's one copy of the drug around uh, in each protomer, five around each five-fold axis of symmetry. So there'd be 60 drugs uh, binding to the particle. The last virus I want to talk about is reovirus because here we understand a little bit why the virus has two icosahedral shells. Last time I told you it's unusual because it's made up of not one but a second shell. It has an inner shell uh, and an outer shell. And these viruses, of course, have a double-stranded RNA genome in segments. So part, just like all the other viruses, these reovirus particles bind plasma membrane receptors. They're taken up into the cell by endocytosis. And then as the endosome acidifies, it fuses with lysosomes. Lysosomes deliver proteases and nucleases, which 
are designed to digest whatever cargo the cell is taken up, but they help uncoat real virus. Most viruses get out of the endocytic pathway before the lysosome fuses, because if they didn't, they would be digested. But real virus, for real virus, the digestion is, an, is a crucial part of uncoating. So what happens is, as the virus moves through the endocytic pathway, the outer shell begins to be digested away. It first becomes uh, what we call an, a, a subviral particle, an infectious subviral particle. And here, most of the uh, outer shell is, is digested away. And that removal exposes hydrophobic sequences on the remaining capsid proteins. So that particle can now penetrate out of the endosome, get in the cytoplasm. And that's now called the core particle. So this is just the inner shell, the inner icosahedral shell, if you will, the double-stranded RNAs are in there, and they, they go on to carry out mRNA synthesis because these double-strand RNAs, again, can't be translated by ribosomes. So that outer shell serves a purpose. It hides the fusion domains in the inner shell. When they're removed in the endosome, then the virus can get into cells. I told you earlier that some viruses use two receptors, and here's a cool example of how that works. Uh, Kaksaki B viruses requires two receptors, one called DAF and the second CAR, which it shares with adenovirus. And uh, DAF is on the epithelial surface of respiratory tract and the gut tract, which is where these viruses infect. But CAR is a tight junction component. It's hidden. So here's an epithelial surface. There's the apical domain. DAF is up there. But CAR is in here. So how does it get there? How does the virus get there? Well, that's why it needs two receptors, because the virus first binds DAF on the epithelial, the apical side of the epithelium. That binding to DAF initiates signal transduction pathways that do a couple of things. You can see the pathways are here. One of them's named after me. Just kidding. <laughs> it loosens up the actin microfilaments so the virus can start to move. Additional signals pass through to loosen up the tight junctions. And when the virus moves to the junction, it can then move in and bind to CAR, which is in the tight junction. So virus binding of, to DAF at the apex is needed to loosen up the junction by signal transduction so that the virus can then get in there. That's why this virus binds uh, to two receptors. I think it's a cool story. So that's a summary of what we've talked about today. We've talked about viruses getting in by endocytic pathways, how fusion occurs uh, by low pH and the changes in structures of viral glycoproteins. We have talked about how some non-enveloped viruses get in by the endocytic pathway. And of course, don't forget that entry can also occur by fusion at neutral pH at the cell surface, at the plasma membrane. And in all cases, the fusion has to be regulated because the virus needs to be in the correct cell to be susceptible and permissive in order for it to replicate. Many of these viruses have to get in the nucleus. So in general, most of the DNA viruses need to get in the nucleus. There are some exceptions that big viruses like pox viruses and some of the other giants, they stay in the cytoplasm. The RNA viruses typically stay in the cytoplasm. The exception is influenza virus. How do you get in the nucleus? Well, for flu, if you remember panel A, when the fusion of the virus in the endosome membrane occurs, that liberates the nucleocapsid, that's the RNA protein complex, the segmented genome, and that simply passes through the nuclear pore into the nucleus because the pores are big enough to accommodate the RNP of the virus passing through them. So that's easy to understand. And of course, there's a nuclear transport mechanism that takes care of that. These ribonucleoproteins of the virus have import signals that have, make the cell machinery take them into the nucleus. But other viruses are too big for their capsids to cross through the pore. And so we have, in some cases, panel B. This would be a herpes virus where there's a portal at one five-fold axis. Remember, last time we showed you that structure, there's a portal where the DNA can come out. And in fact, herpes viruses dock with their portal right on the nuclear pore, and that's how the DNA can get out uh, into this, the nucleoplasm. This third example, panel C, we talked about for adenovirus. The virus is partially disassembled as it comes in through the endosome. When it docks on the nuclear pore, it's really 
a sad case of a virus. And in fact, there are histones that seem to bind the DNA and, and pull it into the nucleus at that point. So adenovirus ar arrives not with a portal, but being partially disassembled. And then there's some very small viruses, like the parvo viruses that we've mentioned a few times, which seem to bind the uh, nuclear pore, but don't go through it. They could, but they seem to induce permeability in other parts of the nuclear membrane and pass through that. So that's the ultimate destination for some of these viruses. I wanted to end up with a story about how differences in the genes encoding these receptors can regulate the kind of disease that we see. And this has to do with rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses, of course, cause common colds, upper respiratory tract infections, but they can also cause lower tract disease, pneumonia, etc. There are many different types of rhinoviruses. We classify them into A, B, and C types. The A and B bind either ICAM-1 or low-density lipoprotein receptor. So here is ICAM-1 schematic and LDLR schematic on the right. And uh, on the left, here's a structure of Rhino-16 bound to ICAM-1. It binds in the canyon, very much like the receptor for polio. And on the right, low-density uh, lipoprotein receptor binding to rhinovirus of other types, which we showed earlier, binds at the plateau. Recently, maybe 10 years ago, a new type of rhino was discovered. They're called Rhino-C. 49 genotypes so far it cause, can cause serious respiratory diseases, especially in children. And the receptor for this family or this group is CDHR3. Uh, and that's shown at the right here. And uh, there's a, an interesting polymorphism in this gene that relates to susceptibility. So here's a schematic of human cadherin related family member three, the receptor for these rhino threes. And there's a very important residue, an amino acid 529 in this fifth domain. We don't yet have a structure of the receptor in the virus, so that we don't know how this is interacting. But a change from C to tyrosine at 529 is linked to increased surface protein, surface levels of the receptor, and increased risk of wheezing and asthma-related illnesses in kids. And the idea is this polymorphism you get more surface level receptors, so you have a better chance of being infected. So that may lead to uh, other diseases like asthma, which are associated with these respiratory infections. And that's been shown in cells. Cells that have this uh, polymorphism have higher binding of virus, and they make more virus. So that may be why this, is, this was originally identified as a childhood asthma risk determinant, independent of rhinovirus. So now we understand that it's a receptor for these viruses. And these viruses contribute largely to uh, wheezing and asthmatic illnesses. So this polymorphism makes perfect sense. Now in 2013, there was an outbreak of rhino C infections in chimps in Uganda. And this is one of them. This is Betty. Unfortunately, she died. And many of these chimps ended up dying from this serious infection. One of these chimps was 57 years old. Can you imagine? And so a group from the University of Wisconsin went in to study them. And they were all homozygous for 529Y. That's the polymorphism that gives you high surface levels of the receptor. Only humans have 529C. And in fact, Neanderthals and Denisovans have Y. So the idea is that this virus came into Homo sapiens and has been lethal, so we have selected for a more protective allele at 529, the allele that gives you lower surface level. So a good fraction of the human population already has C. If you have your genome sequence and you have Y, you should be careful, because this could cause serious disease in you. But all these chimps have Y, and that's because they got this infection from humans. They're in a preserve in the forest, and some humans visited them and probably gave them in the infection. So this means that the virus has not been circulating in chimps. Otherwise, it would have selected for chimps that have the protective allele. So that's a cool story of how you can merge receptor biology with disease susceptibility. And the, the story in, uh, in the Ugandan chimps is one of your reading uh, suggestions if you want to take more look at that. All right, next time in the lecture that is not covered, 
on the exam Wednesday, we're going to talk about RNA-directed RNA synthesis.